الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد as to what proceeds, <coughs> we, beg- we began studying the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha in the month of Ramadan and I promised that I would complete the tafsir of this surah before traveling. <coughs> um, I will be traveling to India the following Sunday, not this Sunday coming, but the next Sunday, ta'ala, in order to collect many of the manuscripts of hadith uh, from the subcontinent. We stopped at the ayah, <coughs> we completed the tafsir of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and Maliki Yomittin. So we completed the tafsir of how many ayat? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is the first ayah of the Basmala is an ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha like I mentioned. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is the second ayah. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is the third ayah. And Maliki Yomiddin is the fourth ayah. So today we will start with the ayah which is Iyya kan a'budu wa Iyya kan istain. Before we start with <coughs> the ayah Iyya kan a'budu wa Iyya kan astain With regards to the first ayah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Then this ayah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Is related to muhabba wa ta'zeem Wa tajleel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim As I mentioned establishes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the attribute of rahmah being merciful and the merciful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of two types that which is specific and that which is general the general mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for everybody those who believe and those who disbelieve those who obey and those who disobey and the specific type of mercy is that which is only for the believers. So Ar-Rahman is the sifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his beautiful name that he is merciful to the whole and entire universe. And Ar-Rahim is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful specifically to the believers. The reason why the believers are favored upon the rest of the creation is that they are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they do that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them and they abstain from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids them then they are entitled to a specific type of mercy so this is as we know wa'id and wa'id after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the is a Rahman and a Rahim he also mentioned after that Maliki Yomittin we know that Malik and Malik different types of recitation both are permissible Malik is which is the famous with regards to Hafs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the master for the day of judgment Yomuddin Deen here refers to Al-Jaza, the day of recompensation. That on the day of judgment, everybody will be accountable and will be requited. Either for those who do good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them with great rewards. And those who will have done bad deeds will be in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes that he will forgive them. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes, he will punish them. This is the madhab of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. For the disobedient slaves on the Day of Judgment, their affair will be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
إن شاء عذبهم وإن شاء غفر لهم. If Allah SWT wishes them, although they are worthy of being punished, but they will be under the the Mashia or the will of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. With regards to the attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, as we know that I mentioned this before and I mention again once again, with regards to understanding the names and attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. These are two names, beautiful names of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and the attribute that is derived from these two beautiful names is Rahmah, which is mercy. But the mercy of Allah is not like the mercy of a human being. We are merciful amongst one another, but the mercy of Allah is not like the mercy of a human being. The human being's mercy is restricted, whereas the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is infinite, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is all powerful. An important point which is with regards to the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which distinguishes Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah from the other deviated sects is two things. And whenever we read the Quran or the Sunnah or we find in the Ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa attributes or sifat of Allah that have been mentioned. For example, we read in the Quran like in Surah Al-Fatiha, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. We also read in the Quran that Allah is Sami'ul Basir, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees. We also read in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Alimun Bidati Sudur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of what is in the hearts. So these attributes that we read, whether they are listening or whether they are seeing, the attribute of listening, the attribute of seeing, the attribute of knowing, all these attributes which are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do we understand them? This is a question. Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah understand them as it was understood by the Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhi majma'een and the Salaf or the pious predecessors of this Ummah. Which is that firstly we affirm the wording for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example the word Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim. These are two beautiful names, and these are two words. And these two words are affirmed by us that we do say that Naam, Allah is Ar Rahman and Allah is Ar Rahim. So this is with regards to its wording, love We affirm them with their wording. Secondly, the word Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim have a meaning. Uh, from these two words, a meaning is derived. What is the meaning that is der derived? Rahmah. That Allah is merciful. Mercy is known to the human being. When the word mercy is used, or when the word rahma is said in the Arabic language, it's known. Its meaning is known. So we affirm the wording and we affirm its meaning. Lavdan wa ma'nan. Why? Because there are many deviated groups amongst the Muslims who reject the wording and who reject its meaning or distort or change its meaning. But Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a, they affirm the wording and they affirm the meaning. Every single word, every single word, for example, Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim are two words. From the, these two words have a meaning. So we affirm the wording and we affirm the meaning. But how do we affirm the wording and the meaning? The meaning that we affirm is at is it as it is known in the Arabic language. Rahma is known in the Arabic language, but with the condition that we do not liken Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no similarity or no similitude between Allah and the, and the creation. Anybody who says that the mercy of Allah is like the mercy of a human being, then this is kufr. Huh? This is blasphemy. And the person, if he believes that the mercy of Allah is like the mercy of a human being, then that person has left the fall of Islam. This is not a, Islam does not teach us this. So we affirm every single attribute of Allah, we affirm that word, meaning the name, as well as its meaning. Every single name has an attribute that can be derived from. Uh, we have a qaida that every single name of Allah has an attribute that can be derived from. So Ar Rahman Ar Rahim are two names, and the attribute that is derived, and the meaning that is derived from them is. Ar-Rahmah, the mercy of Allah 
is not like the mercy of a human being. So this is very important for us to know based upon the ayah in Surah Al-Shura where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لَيْسَ كَمِثْرِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيءُ الْبَصِيرُ That there is nothing like unto him. Meaning there is no equal to him. There is no comparison to him. There is no resemblance to him. And he is the all hearing, the all seeing. So this is with regards to uh, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are mentioned. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Another important point to know is that many of the du'at or many of the brothers and many of the sisters who teach aqeedah, this daqiq mas'ala is neglected by them. In order for us to distinguish haq from batil and those who are upon the straight way from deviancy, the way we differentiate this by saying is that we ahl sunnati wal jama'ah affirm the attributes of Allah with their wording and with their meaning. Lavdan wa ma'nan. Because there are those who say from the mufawwida, a deviated sect, and tafid at this time, bil ma'na, is a disease and a cancer and most the most dangerous form of deviancy with regards to the attributes of Allah. They say that we don't know the meaning, we don't know that Allah is alim. We just know that it's in the Quran, we leave the meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't know whether Allah is alim or whether Allah is rahmah. This is the mufawwida, a deviated sect. And then there are those who interpret and distort the meaning of Ar-Rahmah. So they will say, they are the Asha'ira and the Maturidiyya, two deviated sects who have uh, deviated and are apparent in England where they distort the meanings or they change the meanings. They make Tahrif or they make Ta'wil, which is Batil. So they will say that the hand of Allah means Qudra. That when Allah mentions in the Quran, that Allah has a hand, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam with his two hands. We affirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has two hands in a manner which befits his majesty. But we say that the hands of Allah are not like the hands of, a, of the creation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like Allah hears and sees and is merciful and is knowledgeable, then the knowledge of Allah, the mercy of Allah, the hearing of Allah, the seeing of Allah is not like the hearing, seeing, and mercy and knowing of Allah of, of the human being in the very same way the hands of Allah are not like the hands of a human being only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows their reality he knows his reality but if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirmed and said that he has hands then we believe that he has hands that befit his majesty but if anybody says that Allah's hands have any type of uh, resemblance to the creation then that is blasphemy and is kufr that person has left the fold of Islam. So we affirm their wording and we affirm their meaning. The meaning which is known in the Arabic language, the meaning as it was understood by the Salaf of this Ummah, the Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhim ajma'in. So this is a very important moment. When we say love then, then in, in terms of the love, then we say that we affirm it's love then and ma'nan. By this we refute the mufawwida, the asha'ira, and the maturidiyya. And you will find that the Quran translations that you have of the English language are full of these mistakes when it comes to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of the Quran translations that are read, that are given on Dawah stalls, people don't even know that they are giving people poison when they are giving these Quran translations because the, uh, the sifat of Allah, the attributes of Allah have been distorted in their translations. And you are giving this to the kuffar, trying thinking that we are calling them to Islam because every single translator is upon a particular methodology or a particular belief if he doesn't have the belief of the Salaf and in actual reality we are using those translations and calling people to thinking that we are calling people to Islam but we are actually giving people to read those translations which are poisonous and which are going to distort the meanings uh, of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the correct way of understanding the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى التوفيق والهداية. So this is with regards to the attributes of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Allah سبحانه وتعالى mentions in the Quran after that He says إياه كن عبده وإياه كن استعين. And this is where we stop. That you alone we worship, and from you alone we seek assistance. إياه كن عبده means we specify you with acts of worship. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Iyaka na'budu. The word Iyaka na'budu was used first. The reason of why the word Iyaka was used before na'budu, as we know that Iyaka has been used twice in this ayah. Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. And always remember this rule uh, with regards to the Quran that nothing is repeated in the Quran except that it has a benefit. Some people think when you repeat something and when you speak about something, people think that there is of no benefit. The word Iyaka has been mentioned here twice because it signifies something. The ulama have explained that it signifies something and there is a benefit that has been mentioned in this ayah. This ayah probably is one of the most important ayats of the Quran. Is because this ayah and the one who understands this ayah and the one who implements this ayah between him and the people of deviancy, between haqq and batil, the judge between us, the people who follow the truth, and the people who are upon batil amongst the Muslims, is this ayah. Of how we understand this ayah, and how we implement this ayah in our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and he says, Iyaka na'budu, which means we specify you with acts of worship. Iyaka was put first to convey the concept that worship is being directed only to Allah. When you want to restrict something in the Arabic language, for example, when you say that I eat apples, understand? I eat apples, this could also mean that you eat oranges, you eat bananas. But when you say that I only eat apples, now you have restricted something to say that from amongst the fruit, the only thing that you eat is apples. You do not eat oranges, you do not eat watermelons, you do not eat pineapple, you only and only eat huh? apples. In the way, that's when you restrict yourself. So the word iyaka in the Arabic language, it restricts, it's, it's a restriction. It's something which restricts that you only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That worship is being directed only to Allah. That our ibadah is only for who? For Allah. That we only make ibadah of Allah. And none else other than Allah deserves to be worshipped. That anybody other than Allah that is worshipped is worshipped upon batil. Any deity that is worshipped, any being that is worshipped, any object that is worshipped, is worshipped upon batil. No, not do we only believe that Allah deserves to be worshipped, we also manifest and say that we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why do we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because only Allah deserves to be worshipped. Because Allah is the creator, Allah is the sustainer. Allah is the one who administrates all the affairs of this earth. So the one who creates, the one who sustains, the one who gives life, the one who gives de death, the one who harms and the one who benefits is the one that deserves to be worshipped. So he is the only one that deserves to be worshipped. So that's why we say that you alone we worship. This construction or this sentence, this part of this, of this sentence or this ayah falls under what is called in the Arabic language hasr. Hasr in the Arabic language means to restrict. What does hasr mean? It's strict. When you bring the object before the verb, this is a form of hasr, a form of restriction. This means that only ibadah should only be done for who? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So look at the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching His creation. Not only is He teaching them how they should worship, He is also teaching them that when you supplicate to me, when you supplicate to me, as Surah Al-Fatiha, that when you are supplicating and when you are praising me, you praise me with saying such words that only you, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, deserves to be worshipped alone. Nobody else. So this is called hasr in the Arabic language when you restrict something. And it conveys the meaning that none deserves to be worshipped in truth except you. So, so first Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned which is a form of hasr which is a form of restriction and when we 
I mean, hustle in the Arabic language means that you only restrict it to that who is being mentioned. And here it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first, something was all types of worship. Every single act of ibadah is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, yeah? which is, and from you alone we seek assistance. Nasta'in in the Arabic language refers to seeking help and assistance. The three letters of the Arabic language, Alif, Sa, Alif Sin, and Ta, they represent talab, that you seek. Whenever a verb is preceded by these three letters, Alif, Sa, Sin, and Ta, then it refers to seeking, wanting, talab. So here, the verb is, as we know, is na'in, nasta'in, is from i'ana, seeking help. And alif sa and ti, alif sa, alif sin and ta, have been added in order to ask Allah, to supplicate to Allah, to plead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you need to see, that you are seeking, that we are seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So nasta'in refers to seeking assistance. And doing so is in itself an act of worship. So when we supplicate to Allah, asking for help, so not do not do not only do we need help, we are praying to Allah that He helps us. So first we said that we only worship Allah subhanahu wa taala alone. After mentioning that we that we are mentioning that we only worship Allah subhanahu wa taala, we also said that oh Allah subhanahu wa taala help us we are in need of your help we seek your aid and we seek your assistance so somebody may wonder that why did allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first mention all types of worship in general and then specifically mention the act of ibadah which is known as isti'ana seeking help and assistance so the ulama they have said that this refers to the scholars have explained that this is a case of first mentioning something comprehensive and then mentioning a specific instance. First, umum and awam, all types of worship were mentioned. And then specifically, the act or, or, the, or the, the, an act of ibadah that was mentioned was that you seek aid and assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So worship is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibadah is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from amongst ibadah, any form of ibadah that we do. So think about it. We have general types of ibadah. We have a general type of ibadah. All, all many types of ibadahs. Praying is a form of ibadah. Fasting is a form of ibadah. Zakat is a form of ibadah. Hajj is a form of ibadah. These are all acts of ibadah. But for, to do every single form of ibadah, what do we need? We need the help and assistance of Allah. Without the help and assistance of Allah, we cannot do any act of ibadah. So first Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned and taught us that we should ask Allah, that we, should, we, should, we should praise Allah by saying to Allah that we only worship you. And then after that we should mention, Oh Allah, we, should, we seek your aid and assistance for all these acts of worship that we want to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned first an act of ibadah, acts, acts of ibadah which are general, which are comprehensive. Then he mentioned a specific type of ibadah, a specific, a specific type of ibadah, which is isti'ana, which is to seek aid and assistance, because no act of ibadah can be done by the slave, except that he seeks aid and assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the fa'ida or the benefit that we can derive from this ayah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us that we praise him, and we say that we only worship him alone. That we all our acts of ibadah are only for him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us that we ask him and we supplicate to him and we seek his aid and assistance for all these acts of ibadah which we will do in the near future. So isti'ana is a very important form of ibadah because every single ibadah that we do an act of worship that we do, we cannot do it without the aid and assistance of Allah. So this also another benefit can, that can be derived from this ayah is also 
that no act of ibadah we do not have the ability or the strength to do any act of ibadah no matter how strong or how fit or how intelligent or how knowledgeable we are except with the aid and assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without the aid and assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we cannot do any act of ibadah so iyaka was repeated twice why was iyaka repeated twice i mentioned to you that nothing has been mentioned in the quran even if it's out of repetition except for a purpose except to signify something the reason of why iyaka was repeat, repeated twice to emphasize the fact that nothing deserves to be worshipped except allah and assistance is not to be sought from anything other than allah and this is not the problem that we have today amongst the muslims the problem that we have amongst the Muslims today is that they recite this ayah but they do not understand it because of them not being able to understand this ayah they say with their tongues that oh, that we only worship Allah we only worship you alone and we only ask you for help so somebody may ask what type of assistance are we talking about? are we talking about any simple type of assistance does it mean that if i ask a brother now to help me that i have committed the act of shirk if i say to him can you come and help me my car is not starting can you come and start the car for me you know when we are talking about isti'ana we are talking about isti'ana in those things fima la yaqdiru alayhi illa allah yeah and only in those things which only allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to grant only in those things and from amongst them, it's tawfiq. Tawfiq or having the ability of, of doing good acts of worship. This is from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are talking about the isti'ana or the help in that which only Allah can give you. For example, harm you and harming and benefit. Harming and benefit is only granted by who? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Life and death is granted by who? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you find the ignorant ones who call themselves Muslims, that when they read this ayah, they don't understand this ayah, and they go and seek aid and assistance from the people of the grave. They go, see, go seek aid and assistance from objects like rings. So you see many of them wearing rings, and you say to them, oh, what are you wearing this ring? They say that this ring is something which will protect me from evil, which will protect me from bad which will give me protection. So I ask them how? How is this? So they believe in this. So they have not understood the ayah when we say that this type of protection and this type of benefit or this type of harm that can come to you the only one that can protect you is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only one that can grant you goodness is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this ayah in reality is an ayah which thousands of people pray in salah but very few understand this ayah. The reason of why Allah mentioned إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَئِينَ إِيَّاكَ وَإِيَّاكَ Why was إِيَّاكَ وَإِيَّاكَ mentioned? It was mentioned to emphasize with ta'keed that only Allah is to be worshipped and only Allah is to be asked for help. For. That only you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to assist you and to help you. If you ask anybody other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then you have gone against the essence of al Islam and you have gone against the uh, gone against this ayah. So the so from this we understand that when we look at this ayah from this perspective, we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us in every single salah of ours and in, in, in every single dua of ours that we first glorify Allah by Allah by saying that only he deserves to be worshipped in all acts of worship and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we seek his aid and his assistance in that to aid us in our acts of ibadah and we seek, we seek his aid and assistance only in those things in only which Allah can grant us or in those things which Allah can protect us so from this we also understand that uh, many of those Muslims who are ignorant and who have turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they turn to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have not understood the ayah إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the ayah where he says 
اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ So this is a supplication. The first ayah, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, as we mentioned, was with regards to seeking aid and assistance with the name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen was to love and show manifest love and veneration for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim was to establish that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala promises that He is merciful. Maliki Yomiddin was to also show that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is is warning those who do not fear that on the day of judgment that they will have to they will be held accountable on the day of judgment and that they will be a resurrection and if they have done good deeds and if they have believed in Allah then they will be rewarded and if they have not done good deeds and if they have disbelieved in Allah then they will be thrown into the hell fire and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned when he mentioned this ayah by teaching us that we learn how to make ibadah of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us how we should supplicate to him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us that when we make ibadah, we should seek his aid and assistance. How many Muslims do we find today that when they make acts of ibadah, when we, when we ourselves as Muslims, not being conscious, when we want to pray salah, when we want to do a good deed, when we want to give sadaqah, do we seek aid and assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly? So we need to be conscious that whenever we want to do an act of ibadah, the first thing that we should do is seek Allah's aid and assistance. So, oh Allah, aid me and assist me. Oh Allah, grant me the tawfiq to do such and such action. Supplicate to Allah. It doesn't have to be with your tongue necessarily. It can even be in your heart. That you have this supplication, you have this thought that you supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as we know that Allah, that the tawfiq is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah mentions in the Quran where he states وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ that my tawfiq is only with who? with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so no act of worship is done except with the tawfiq of Allah and one of the ways of attain, obtaining tawfiq of Allah is by seeking Allah's aid and assistance isti'ana so we have isti'ana after isti'ana will come tawfiq after tawfiq the action will be done after the action is done then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept it if it is in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah, if there is sincerity and if there is mutaba'ah, meaning that it's in accordance to the Sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that mentions, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ This is a supplication, this is a dua. So after this um, love, uh, manifesting love and veneration, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's promise of being merciful, Allah's promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us accountable then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching us that we should only make ibadah of him and we should seek his assistance before making any act of ibadah from this ayah now the supplication or the ad'iyah start so ihdina sirat al-mustaqim is a dua this is a dua which has been mentioned which we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is guide us to the straight path so this is a supplication in which a request is made. We are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us. And Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen at the beginning of the surah is a supplication of worship. So Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen with love and veneration is also a supplication. And Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem is also a supplication. This distinction is made since supplications are classified into two categories. So dua are of two types, the Ahlul Imsay. So Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen is also a dua. Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim is also a dua. The, what is the difference between this dua, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, and Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim? The ulama they say that the first category is supplication of worship. Supplic dua, dua al ibadah. And this category uh, comprises praise and glorification of Allah. So some types of du'a, some types of du'a consist of what? They consist of praise and glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So du'a are of two types. The first category is when you praise Allah, and when you glorify Allah, and when you venerate Allah, and when you um, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So praising Allah, glorifying Allah, venerating Allah, these is this is a form of dua the second category 
as explained by the people of knowledge is supplication in which a request is made when you request something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like in the case of this ayah here we are not praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are making dua but what type of dua are we making? we're making a request to Allah what's the request that we are making? the request that we are making to Allah is that Allah guides us to the straight path and an instance of this is from as we know Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim until the end of Surah Fatiha. So from Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim till the end of Surah Al Fatiha is a dua which is requesting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for many different things. So dua is of two types, two categories. A dua in which we glorify Allah, in which we praise Allah, in which we venerate Allah and we love Allah. This is a form of a dua. And the second type of dua is when we, when we supplicate to Allah, but we request that Allah grants us something. Like in this case. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and He teaches us from Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim to Walad Dalin. This is all dua ut talab, meaning a dua which there is a request. A dua which is a, a request. Ihdina is a request for guidance. Uh, Ihdina is a request for guidance in the form of being shown what is correct. Guidance may be classified, or you can say, into four categories. So, Hidayah, some of the people of knowledge uh, have categorized Hidayah into four categories, but some of the people of knowledge have classified Al Hidayah into two main categories meaning that these four categories can be divided or can be categorized in two categories the first category is the category of guidance is the directing to someone what is right so one type of hidayah is what they call hidayatul irshad hidayatul irshad is when you guide somebody to do something which is right so if somebody is practicing and uh, practicing an innovation in the deen of allah and you go to them and you give them da'wah and you guide them you guide how do you guide them you guide them back to the sunnah by telling them about the sunnah and by warning them against uh, this bid'ah then this is known as hidayatul irshad and this is this can be done by anybody anybody who is firmly upon the kitab and the sunnah who is a muslim uh, he can guide uh, anybody as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the quran where he says wa innaka لَتَهْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that uh, he mentions when the translation of the ayah is that you indeed guide to a path which is straight. So this is known as Hidayatul Irshad. This type of Hidayah or guidance is a guidance in which you direct somebody to do something which is right. إِهْدِنَا الصِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمِ The second category of guidance is enabling someone to accept what is right. To accept what is the truth, something what is right. This type of guidance is only for who is more specific, and this guidance is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can guide somebody to accept the truth. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can guide somebody to accept the truth. So the prime example that we have here is Abu Talib and the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he gave da'wah to his uncle Abu Talib the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called him to that which was right. He gave Hidayatul Irshad. He told Abu Talib that worshipping idols is batil and worshipping Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala alone in truth is the haq. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not make him accept the truth. From this we also understand that there is no force according to the madhab of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah that a person uh, we believe in the concept of free will that a person is to choose from what, that, what, what is right and what is wrong and that guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only and I said if people were already decreed of being upon right and upon wrong then the benefit of giving them da'wah would have no purpose Huh? If people were already either rightly guided or misguided, then what would there be the need of giving that? 
Da'wah is connected to Hidayatul Irshad. The Hidayah to, to inform somebody or to guide somebody to that which is right. But the acceptance of, uh, of, of, of the truth, then this is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As was the case with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa could not make his uncle, who was the most beloved to him, who was not only the protector for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but was the protector of Al-Islam and the Muslims during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he could not accept the truth. Because this is the second category of guidance, is the Hidayat al-Tawfiq, as we say. What do we call this? Hidayat al-Tawfiq. We have Hidayat al-Irshad and we have Hidayat al-Tawfiq. Hidayat al-Irshad is for the Prophets and the Messengers and those who follow their footsteps to direct somebody towards that which is right. But Hidayat al-Tawfiq, then this is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is accepting the truth. You could give somebody da'wah for hours, but he will not accept it. You are practicing Hidayat al-Irshad by, by, by guiding him to that which is right, but you are not able to make him accept the truth. This is only from who? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in, in the Quran where he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاء That you cannot guide those whom you love. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had loved his uncle Abu Talib because he was his blood. He was his uncle. He protected him. He protected him from the, 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 um, the trials and the sufferings of the kuffar. But the Prophet Sallallahu could not make him accept the truth. So this shows that Hidayat al-Tawfiq is fadl from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It's a fadl, it's a mercy, it's a bounty. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala chooses to whom he guides. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَيْ يَشَعَ As we understand. So this ihdina is a request for both types of guidance from Allah. To be shown and directed of what is right as well as to be enabled to accept it and remain firm in following it. So as we know that the Hidayah is of two types, Hidayatul Irshad and Hidayatul Tawfiq. Hidayatul Irshad is for the khalq of those who are upon righteousness, who are upon guidance, who follow the way of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we know that Hidayatul Tawfiq is something which is only for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, which is to accept the truth. When the Muslim and this ayah supplicates ihdina, he is supplicating for both types of guidances. He is supplicating that Allah guides him with to be from amongst those who is able to direct others towards good. And he is also asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he guides him with his tawfiq to the straight path. So this shows that there will be many people who will not be upon the straight path. There will be many of many, many people or many Muslims who will not be upon the straight path. Why? Because somebody may know the truth, but whether he accepts the truth or not is a different thing. Just like the Jews, the Jews, they knew Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as, as it will come, was the messenger of Allah. He was the final messenger, as it has been mentioned in the Torah. So they knew the truth. Hidayatul Irshad came to them, when they read the scriptures. But did the tawfiq come to them to accept the truth? La. This was only granted by who? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not decreed for them, many of them at that time, to be rightly guided. Except for the likes of Abdullah ibn Salam, radiallahu an, and others who accepted when they read in the scriptures and when they saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tawfiq was written for them and has, had been decreed for them with regards to being rightly guided. So in this ayah, ihdina, Ihdina is that we ask Allah to guide us, that we are able to rightly guide others, which is upon pure knowledge, and we also that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala guides us with His tawfiq upon the straight path. So a sirat literally means a path upon which humans and other creatures walk. Sirat, the word sirat in the Arabic language means a path, pathway upon which human beings and uh, creatures. Uh, they are more upon. However, the, the intended meaning of a sirat here 
is the path that compri comprises Islam. So as sirat here is referring to what? As sirat here is referring to Al Islam. So Al Islam comprises Islam, the Quran, and Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the tafsir of as sirat al mustaqim, some of the mufassirun they say that as sirat al mustaqim refers to Al Islam. Some of the uh, mufassirun they say as sirat al mustaqim refers to the Quran. Some of the Mufassirun, they say that as sirat al-Mustaqim refers to Muhammad. And there is no contradiction whether it's al-Islam, whether it's Quran, or whether it's Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is something which is known as ikhtilaf al not ikhtilaf al That sir, the right path is al-Islam. The right path is to follow the Quran. The right path is to follow Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as sirat al-mustaqim is al-Islam. As sirat al-mustaqim is to follow the Quran. As sirat al-mustaqim is to follow Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So all these tafasir that can be found are all correct. That whether it's referring to the Quran, whether it's referring to al-Islam, or whether it's referring to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And like I mentioned in the previous ayah, when I said, I wa iyyaka nasta'in, the first comes seeking aid and assistance of Allah. But we seek Allah's assistance to be rightly guided. That nobody is rightly guided because of their knowledge. Nobody is rightly guided because of their intelligence. Every single person that is rightly guided is rightly guided because of the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should continue seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance in being rightly guided. When we make isti'ana of Allah, we make isti'ana of Allah for the hidayah of Allah. And the hidayah of Allah comprises or consists of the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is for this reason that we find that you will find somebody who is able to build a nuclear weapon to destroy the world. You will see him doing what? You will see him bowing down to a grave. And you will see a peasant who works in the farm, who has no knowledge, who is not who is completely Ill illiterate, but you will see him being firm upon the Tawheed of Allah. This in itself shows that intelligence and education cannot rightly guide you to the truth. That which can only rightly guide you to the truth is the Tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if it was the case that your knowledge or your status or your wealth or your, in your intelligence was to rightly guide you to the truth, then you will not see a nuclear scientist making shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will not see a peasant or a farmer or a Bedouin who has no knowledge, who cannot read and write being rightly guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this shows that when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we as Muslims, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rightly guided us to the straight path, which is Islam, which is Al-Quran, which is Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then we should continue asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us firmly rightly guided. So if somebody is rightly guided, he must not stop. He must continue. And it is for this reason that we find in this ayah that in every single salah, for those who are rightly guided, they supplicate and they say, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim And those who are not rightly guided, if they are to supplicate, they are also commanded to say, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his will and with his mercy and with his tawfiq will guide those people to the straight path. Naam. So this was with Sirat al Mustaqim. The next ayah that we have is Sirat al Ladina and Amta Ali. So after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentioned about the path. And like I said to you, the path is which path? The path is referring to the path of Al-Islam and Al-Islam. Who knows what, you know, what is Al-Islam? If there's there anybody that can define Islam for us here. If we are told Submission, submission, huh? submission to Allah. Submission to the will of Allah. Huh? Anybody else? It's Islam. Ah. Submission. 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 Taib. 
So what is the difference between us and the Jews and the Christians? The Jews have submission to Allah. Are they submissive to Allah? Ah, the Jews. Do you know the Jews? Huh? You don't know Jews? Do you know the Jews? Have you seen a Jew? Does a Jew grow a beard? Have you seen his locks? The locks that he has? And he wears that white thing that he wears. And on Saturday he doesn't do nothing. Why does he do all this? <coughs> Why does he do all this? Out, well, what is the reason that he does submission this is his submission to Allah so if the Jew is submissive to Allah and the Muslim is submissive to Allah then what is the difference between us and them there has to be a difference huh? the, the Muslim submission is complete the, the Muslim submission is complete, complete yes. how how is it com yeah. how well the Jew is following everything that is in the Torah. If you say to him, he will say to you, even my, bring me something from the Torah which I don't believe and which I don't do. But they are not following uh, the path of Nabi Muhammad They are not following the path of Muhammad But before that? What is the difference? Huh, what's the difference between our submission and the submission of the Jew? What is the difference between our submission and the submission of the Christian? There is a difference? There is a difference. Are the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims the same? Ah, what do you say? Tawheed. <coughs> the difference between us and them is that we submit to Allah with Tawheed. And they submit to Allah with a shirk. They have shirk. So their submission in reality is not a submission. So everything that they are doing is a waste of time. Huh? Growing the beard and not eating on Saturday and wearing the white thing and running around on every Saturday when I'm in London my father-in-law's house is in Stock Newington I see them up and down up and down you know they like the Ifrit and the Shayateen al ins going up and down you know lost Yatihuna fil ard you know when I read the ayah Yatihuna fil ard that they are lost in the land I didn't understand this ayah until I saw until I moved to Stock Newington even now they are looked that they are lost the way, the way many of them they were. So the difference between us, our Al Islam, the meaning of Al Islam, is Al Istislamu Lillahi Bit Tawheed. When we say the word Bit Tawheed, now we have expelled the Jews and the Christians because they also submit to Allah, Al Istislamu Lillah, but, 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 but not Bit Tawheed, Bit Shirk. Hmm? Or al -istis their istislam of Allah is not accepted because they have rejected the risala of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So al Islam, as Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions, sirat al ladin an amta alim that al istislam lillahi bi tawheed. That the first thing is that the Muslim he submits to Allah with tawheed. Wal inqiyad lahu bi taah, and then he is obedient to him with. With obedience, with obedience, with ta'ah. Then, وَالْبَرَاءَةُ مِنَ الشِّرْكِ وَأَهْلِهِ Then he frees himself from the shirk and its people. So he frees himself from the Jews, from the Christians. He frees himself from the Hindus. He frees himself from the Sikhs. He frees himself from all those people who make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everybody that is not upon Islam has fallen upon shirk and kufr. Even for the one who says that he does not worship anybody or anything is an atheist, in reality he worships his desires. He has taken his desires, his whims, as his ilah. As Allah says in the Quran, Afara'ayta man ittakhada ilahahu hawa. So there's nobody who is free from either you upon tawheed or either you upon shirk. There is no in betweens. So as, a, as we know that we have to. Uh, the submission of a Muslim uh, the Sirat al-Islam is to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a submission to Allah with Tawheed وَالْإِنْقِيَادُ لَهُ بِالْتَعَى and to yield or follow that with obedience and to free yourself from shirk and its people as Allah says what does Allah say about Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran what does he say he says مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيَّ وَلَا نَصْرَانِيَّ وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Allah didn't just say that he's Hanifa Muslima 
He freed himself from the mushrikeen as well. He said he wasn't from, he's not from the Jews or from the Christians. Neither was he a Jew. Neither was he a Christian. But he was Hanif or Muslim. He swayed away from their shirk. Completely away from their shirk. With submission to Allah with Tawheed. And Allah said, وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ So this is Islam. Al-Islam is my brother, what is it? Al-Istislamu lillahi bit tawheed. When you don't use the word at tawheed, then there's no difference between us and the Jews and the Christians. You know, in India, you see that the Muslims can't wake up for Salatul Fajr, but you see the Hindus, they're already up four o'clock in the morning. Huh? And they're ringing their bells, and they're worshipping penises and... Uh, Everything that moves, you know, private parts and rats and everything that moves that they worship. Taib. This is their submission, this is their Islam. Al Islam to what? To their deities, to their false deities, upon Batir, upon Shirk. So everybody has Al Islam, submission. But the submission of a Muslim is the submission of a Muslim to Allah with Tawheed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, He says, Sirat al Ladina and Amta alayhim. The path of those upon whom you have bestowed your favor. Tayyip. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes ascribes this path to himself. He says, وَأَنَّ هَذَا سِرَاتِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُ So with regards to this, so with regards to the path of those upon who have been rightly guided, then we know that this ayah is referring to who? This ayah is referring bil ijma, bil ijma al umma of the Muslimin, referring to who? To the Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhim ajma'in for us. For us, it's referring to who? It's referring to the Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhim ajma'in. That they are the Salaf or our predecessors. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said with regards to them, radiyallahu anhum. And with regards to the Sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhim ajma'een, when this ayah was revealed, when they were alive, then it was referring to those who? It was referring to those prophets and their messengers, and their nations and their people who came before them, and who were upon the straight path. So when the Sahaba, when they, when they supplicated with this ayah, it was referring to the prophets that came before Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu like Musa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam and Yahya alayhi salam and Zakaria alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam all from Nuh alayhi salam till Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam all those prophets and messengers and all their companions who were upon the straight path that just like Allah guided those prophets and their messengers and their people the Sahaba supplicated to Allah that also rightly guide that the straight path which we want to follow is that same path which you guided those who came before us. For us who came after the Sahaba, then this is referring to those prophets and their messengers and the previous nations, as well as the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Majma'een. Because the first rightly guided people with the message of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the best of all people after the prophets and the messengers are who? The Sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhi majma'een radiyallahu anhu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is a refutation of the Rafida or the Shia who are the only nation are the, sorry the only people in the history of mankind and listen to this very carefully every single from the time of Nuh alayhi salam to Muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam no nation that has come from the time of Nuh alayhi salam to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has ever has ever attacked the companions of a prophet or a messenger. They have always waged war and said that these are the most sincere people towards this prophet and this message. Except for the Khubatha that came after Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that, that they are the first people in the history of mankind who say to the people that the companions of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were hypocrites and were disbelievers. The only people on the Qatalahumullah, these liars. That there has not been akhbath, filthy people 
on the face of this earth that we find than this Rafida Shia who attack the companions Ridwan Allah and this ayah in itself is a refutation upon them where Allah says to us Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim and we say Sirat al Ladina and Amta Alayhi the straight path the path of those whom you have bestowed your favor so we ask now that during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as they say that who were the ones who Allah had bestowed their favor upon who were they the Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhim ajma'in were they not amongst those who were bestowed this favor and before the Sahaba the prophets and the messengers and their people so that's why we say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is amongst he is the best prophet and the messenger amongst all the prophets and the messengers he is from amongst mankind and jinn the most noble the most virtuous we also say that his companions after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are the prophets and the messengers after the prophets and the messengers the most afdal or the most virtuous person is who is abu bakr radiyallahu anhu and then umar and then uthman and then Ali and then all the other companions and the companions in general after the prophets and the messengers are the best of all people the most noble of all people the most loved people and that's why Allah SWT says in the Quran that whether the Rafidah like it or don't like it whether the Shia like it or not like it upon their tongues in every single Salah they have to praise the companions Ridwan Allah alayhi majma'in this is an uquba and a punishment for them that even upon their tongues that their salah will not be accepted if they don't say sirat al their salah which is batil but according to them that even their salah will not be uh, accepted according to their own principles if they do not complete the fati and say sirat al ladina and amta alayhim so sirat al ladina and amta alayhim is referring to who is referring to the sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhim ajma'in and those who came after them who were rightly guided so it's referring to the Salaf of this Ummah as we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said وَخَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ that the best of people are my people and then those who come after them and then those who come after them the Salaf of this Ummah so this ayah is referring to the Sahaba رِضْوَانَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ مَجْبَئِنْ بِالْإِتِّفَاقِ and then those who came after them from amongst the students and those who came after them from amongst the students meaning the tabi'un and the atba'ut tabi'in as the prophet sallallahu said which is the golden era or which is known as al qurun al mufaddala they were the rightly guided people and this ayah in itself is proof people ask now what is the proof that we should follow the salaf i say that one of the ayat or one of the ayats uh, ayahs which we can use as proof to follow the salaf is sirat al ladina and amta alayhim because this is a tazkiyah from who a tazkiyah from a reference from who from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it obligatory upon us that not only should we ask to be rightly guided not should we only ask that allah guides us to the straight path we have also been obliged that we ask allah to keep us upon the way of the self of this ummah that our dua that our guidance our supplication which allah has taught us who 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 has taught us to make this dua allah allah has taught us to make dua for hidayatul irshad for hidayatul tawfiq allah has taught us to make dua of sirat al mustaqim sirat al mustaqim is allah's path sirat al mustaqim is al islam sirat al mustaqim is al quran sirat al mustaqim is muhammad sirat al mustaqim is also sabil al mu'minin so, sirat al mustaqim is also sabil al mu'minin sirat al mustaqim is also the the tariq or the way of the sahaba ridwan allah alayhim ajma'in because when this ayah was revealed they were the ones who were upon the straight path yeah, and they are the ones who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored by granting them tawfiq wal hidayah so that they be rightly guided so this is an ayah in itself proof that to follow the way of the salaf one of the ayats to prove that following the salaf and to ascribing yourself to the manage of the salaf and being a salafi is from the Quran where Allah says Sirat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim an'amta 
alayhi. Which also shows that hidayah is a ni'mah. Another benefit that we can derive is that hidayah is a ni'mah, it's a blessing. So blessings are given to whom Allah wills. So in blessings and in fadl, there hasn't the, 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 is the condition is not that you are equal or, or that you should give everybody equally. Fadl and a blessing is given to whom you will. Somebody has to earn a blessing to be granted a privilege. And this is done by supplication. This is done by seeking aid and assistance. And this is done by accepting the truth when it comes, wanting to accept the truth. So we find that ni'mah, the hidayah and ni'mah have a connection. Because Allah mentions an amta alayhim, that you are, that you have bestowed upon them. Alayhim refers to the prophets and the messengers and their companions who accepted Islam. And it also refers to the Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhi majma'een. And it also refers to those who came after them. It is a refutation of the Shia, the Khubatha, and it is also proof that we should follow the way of the Salafus Salih. The Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhim ajma'in. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions where he says, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ The last part of Surah Al-Fatiha. Not those who have earned your wrath and not those who have been led astray. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ so with regards to this ayah, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الطَّالِينَ The Mufassirun, they say, not those who have earned your wrath. This is referring to the Yahud. This is referring to the, the Jews. And غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ And وَلَا الضَّالِينَ of those who have been led astray is referring to the Nasar. So Allah SWT mentioned two groups of people. He mentioned the Sirat al ladina and Amta alayhim. Then he mentioned غير المغضوبة. So a dua started by asking Allah for Hidayat al Irshad wa Tawfiq. Then Sirat al Mustaqim. Then Allah SWT explained that this right path is the path which He has bestowed upon those who came before us, which are the Prophets and the Messengers and their nations. And for us, the Sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhim ajma'in, a refutation for the Shia and a proof that we have to follow the Salaf. So whether the people love the Salaf was Salih, whether they follow the Salaf was Salih, or whether they don't follow the Salaf was Salih, in every single ayah of the Quran, Allah has made it obligatory upon them that they ask Allah to guide them to the Salafi, to the, Salaf, to the, to the way of the Salaf, or to the Salafi manhaj, or the, the way of the Sahaba, Ridwan Allah alayhi majma'in. Then Allah mentioned that, after mentioning that the type of guidance we should have, the people that we should follow. Then Allah has taught us that we should also supplicate to Allah that Allah save us from who? From those who have been led astray and they are the Jews and the Christians. Those who have earned Allah's wrath. So in this ayah, the last part of Surah Al-Fatiha is a refutation. The last part of our dua in every single salah is a refutation. Now people don't like refutations. Huh? Sometimes you hear people say, you know, I, no, no, I don't like when people criticize people, you know, we should all be together, there should be love, you know, there should be harmony. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, in the very first surah of the Qur'an, refutes those who claim that they love him the most. Who are they? Two types of people, the Jews and the Christians. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refutes them. So this shows that refutation is part of our deen. We cannot shy away from refutation. But who are the people who should refute? The people who should refute are the qualified ones, the scholars and the people of knowledge. Not anybody. Not anybody that decides that he puts a camera in front of him, makes a clip and then uploads it on YouTube. This is what's happening today. If you see a lot of the refutations today, Celebrity refutations, we call them. Huh? No knowledge. Some of them cannot even recite Quranic ayats properly. They haven't even studied formally and they want to refute. As one of our sheikh used to say, and he used to always say this in class, he says, he used to say, Rahimahullah, he used to say that to study Islam and to have Islamic knowledge, you know, inherit, inheritance, 
inheritance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the mirath or the inheritance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not just given to anybody you have to earn that inheritance meaning you have to be eligible for that inheritance that inheritance is only given to who? to the scholars as they say that Al-Ulama Warathatul Anbiya why did they say Al-Ulama? they didn't say YouTubers are the inheritors of the prophets they said al ulama warathatul anbiya they didn't say cel celebrities are inheritors of the prophets that the more famous you become you are from the inheritors of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said al ulama warathatul anbiya so the prophets and the ulama are the inheritors of the prophets this knowledge comes with hardship with sacrifice you have to give it everything you have only then does this, this, this knowledge come to you what do we find today? We find that those who have no knowledge, those who are not qualified, those who have not studied, those who have not been endorsed by the scholars, they are speaking about Al-Islam. And our Shaykh used to say, he used to say that every single person wants to defend Al-Islam, but nobody wants to learn about it. Huh? What he used to say? Uh, everybody wants to be the spokesman. Anything about Islam, he wants to be the first one in the media. I will speak, I will speak. But when it comes to learning about Islam, he will be the first one to run away from this store. And he won't be able to sit 5-10 minutes. So if he's sitting in class, he's sleeping. He can't sit for what? In, 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 in the majalis of the ulama, sometimes you sit for 5-6 hours without getting up. Continuous studies. Here, in this country, people can't attend 45 minutes. They say, oh, 45 minutes is a long lesson. Man. We need breaks. You know, before you, the first thing when you go to somebody to talk about a seminar, the first thing they will look at is breaks and lunch. <laughs> huh? Where are we going to fit in the lunch and where are we going to fit in the breaks? How long is going to be the lunch break and how long is it? Oh, we'll have, a, we'll have a coffee break, you know, we'll have a tea break, you know. Like my father used to say, my granddad used to say that whenever he used to uh, employ the white people, um, the, Brit the Brits, to come and work at his house, to do some, you know, repairing the roof and that, he said that they'll come work for five hours and they'll have six tea breaks. Every time you see them, they're having a tea break. Yeah? Every time you see them, they're having a tea break. So the whole day goes. So with my dad, he now used to pay them hourly. He used to pay them by contract. You finish this work, this much money I give you. You can take 30, 40 tea breaks, I don't care. I want the work done. It's the same here when you go to study something about Islam. It's about uh, when is going to be the when when we're going to have we're going to have a tea break here tea break here lunch break here what we're going to have we're going to have chicken and chips wings this 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 is all this everything the the lights have to be nice uh, the, the 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 decoration has to be good so Allah in Hind in India Pakistan in such places we we sit with the ulama for two three hours without getting up and we don't leave the majlis until the until the sheikh stands up okay? and only somebody who's very desperate to go to the bathroom. You know, he stand up and he'll do this. You know, this in uh, Pakistan and India means that he needs to go to the bathroom. And the Sheikh will look at him like that. Even then he will be, feel embarrassed, although he's in need. Yeah? So this is knowledge. So knowledge, like our Sheikh said, that everybody wants to defend Al-Islam, but nobody wants to learn about it. Yeah? So refutations, refutations, Allah SWT refutes in the Quran. The whole Quran is a refutation. But refutation based upon knowledge, ilm, basira, and justice. Yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not degrade. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not degrade or in any way insult yeah, when he refutes. To the extent that Allah says in the Quran, with regards to the idols of the kuffar, وَلَا تَصُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَصُبُّوا اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِخَيْرِ إِلْمٍ that do not even swear at the idols of the polytheists because in retaliation they may swear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowledge so Islam has wawabit so refutation is part of our deen and we should not be shy from refuting we should not be shy of exposing the batil if the haq and the batil is not separated then the people will be in a calamity but who are the people that refute? who are the people that speak about these affairs? those who have knowledge and even from amongst the people of knowledge you will find that there are many scholars but some of the scholars will not refute they will say refutation is specific for only a certain group of ulama certain group of scholars who are qualified who know about the deviancy of such people so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refutes he refutes in the Quran 
And he refutes the Jews. And he refutes the Christians. Where he says, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِ The reason of why Allah's wrath descended upon the Jews is why? Is because the Jews knew the truth, they knew the haqq, but they did not accept it out of arrogance. So there's a lot of people, they ask, they say, so-and-so person, you will see today on social media, that so-and-so person, he studied in India, he studied in Pakistan, he studied in Medina, you know, but he says it's okay to shake hands with women, you know, it's homosexuality is okay, you know, these type of things, you will see. So people will be baffled, people get baffled, people are like, shocked when they hear this they say he studied Medina you know, he graduated from Medina and he's saying this it's okay to shake a hand of a, a woman it's okay homosexuality there's no real problem with homosexuality so people they get baffled and people get perplexed but the answer to this is simple my brothers what is the answer the answer is that the Jews they knew the haqq as Allah SWT mentions in the Quran that they knew Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ That they knew Muhammad Rasulullah just as they know their children. But did they accept the truth? No. So it is not a condition that just because you know the truth that you adhere to the truth. You can sway away anytime. And this whole tafsir from Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, this is the focal point of this tafsir of this surah. The Hidayatu Tawfiq is not based upon how much knowledge or which certificate or which institute that you have graduated from. Hidayatu Tawfiq is Mujarrad bin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a peasant who's working in the farms, <laughs> who is the most ignorant of people, can be rightly guided, and the most intelligent man. Who claims, to, who claims to have been to the moon will be misguided. It's possible. This shows. So don't be shocked when you see, you know, people who have studied, graduated, who will say, you don't have to keep the beard. Ah, the beard is okay. Music is a difference of opinion. Putting the, you know, putting your trousers below the ankles. It's okay if it's not done with pride. These fatawa out there. People who have studied in Medina are saying this. Or what? But know one thing, that the Jews also knew the truth. As Allah mentions in the Quran, the Jews knew that Muhammad Rasulullah came with the haqq. The Jews knew that the Prophet the risala was the risala which they had been waiting for. But their arrogance and following their desires and their shahwa and their hawa stopped them and prevented them from the truth. So Allah SWT mentioned the Jews and all those who follow the footsteps of the Jews. So you find somebody who they say, for example, you know, they say he's a Sheikh al Hadith. You know, he knows Bukhari, he teaches Bukhari. But you don't see him doing Raf al Yadain. Huh? You don't see him doing Raf al Yadain. You don't see him doing Amin bil Jahr. You say, wow, this guy teaches Bukhari. Huh? He's a Sheikh al Hadith. But he doesn't say Amin bil Jahr. He doesn't raise his hands in Salah Raful Yadain, which is a Sunnah which is Mutawatira. So many will say, I can't, how, such a great Alim, such a great scholar, he must have some knowledge. La. We say clearly, we have a simple answer to this. For those who have studied the Tafsir of Surah Al Fatiha, will know that it's Hidayat al Tawfiq. To raise your hands in Salah, huh? tell me now, to raise your hands in Salah is a big thing. How many inches do you have to raise your hands? Is difficult? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Difficult? No. But how many people have tawfiq to do this inside salah? This shows that the only person that can do raful yadain inside salah, he who is muwaffaq min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can have oceans of knowledge, but he will not be able to raise few inches of his hand in salah because he's ghair muwaffaq in the sunnah. So my brothers, whether he's a sheikh, or whether he's an imam, or whether he's the most knowledgeable man, or whether he's memorized Bukhari, or whether he's memorized Muslim, know that the tawfiq of Allah is something else which Allah grants to whom he wills. Hmm? 
It's not with regards to who you are and how great you are and how much knowledge you have. Like I said to you, that muwaffaq min Allah is, as Allah mentions in the Quran, what does Allah say? Inna akramakum in dallahi atqaqum. That the most honorable unto Allah is the one who is the one who has the most taqwa. And the one who has most taqwa, the one who wants the haqq, the one who wants to follow the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the example of the Jews and those who follow the footsteps of the Jews. So all the deviated groups, that the haqq comes to them and they reject it. All those scholars who know the truth but reject it and don't accept it and don't follow it, they are part of this part of this ayah when Allah says, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِ Why? Because Allah's wrath has descended upon them is because they have the knowledge but they don't act upon that knowledge. They can only act upon that knowledge when they make isti'ana, when they seek Allah's aid and assistance. When they seek Allah's aid and assistance, and when they seek Allah's aid and assistance, the hidayah will come. When the hidayah will come to them, when they will be granted hidayah, then the tawfiq of Allah will be given to them. When the tawfiq of Allah is given to them, then they will be, act, will be able to act upon the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Something so simple to raise your trousers a few inches huh, above your ankles, to raise your hands in salah, few inches difficult uh, paralyzed uh, one of our sheikh used to say that their hands become paralyzed in salah what happens it is as though that their hands become paralyzed shalal because they are not muwaffaq of practicing the sunnah of muhammad rasulullah it is as though they lose their voices when the amin when the imam says walad dalin amin the masjid of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is to echo as the hadith says, Sahih Hadith says, that the Ameen was so loud of the Sahaba, that the, must, the walls of the Masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to echo. But you find somebody can't say Ameen aloud. He's, he, no matter how many, how many narrations you give him, the Prophet did this, the Sahaba did this, if you, if you, Ameen, if you say Ameen with the Ameen of the angels, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will forgive all your sins, nothing, it is like talking to a brick wall. Why? Because the tawfiq is not there for him. The tawfiq is with who? We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to give us tawfiq, to follow every single sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the one who follows the sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the one who is muwaffaq of following every single sunnah. That's why you find that you find a man in Darul Kufr in Northampton, firm upon the sunnah, and you find a man I have seen in front of the Kaaba, and all his actions are against the sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This shows that the tawfiq of Allah is not restricted to any place or any race or any time Allah can guide somebody in Darul Kufr and misguide somebody who is in front of the Kaaba Allah can guide somebody who is in Northampton and somebody who is misguided can be in Masjid Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Tawfiq is Hidayah from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala He gives it to whom He wills there is nobody and it's a Fadl and a Na'mah a Tawfiq, Hidayah is a Na'mah so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentioned who? He mentioned the Jews and those who follow the footsteps of the Jews. The footsteps of the Jews are all the misguided scholars, all the misguided du'at, all those who know the haqq, all those who know the sunnah, but they deviate from it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned waladdalli, the Christians. Why did he say not those who have been led astray? Why did the Christians le be led astray? Because we find that between the Christians and the Jews, there was two extreme. The Christians, the Jews had knowledge but they did not act upon it. And the Christians, they exaggerated in their ibadah and they had no knowledge. To Rahbani, to the extent that they went so exaggerated so much in the ibadah that they secluded themselves uh, from the people. And they started inventing such acts of ibadah. Ma anzalallahu biha min sultan. So we have misguided, or those who have been misguided are of two types. Either those who have knowledge and they know the haqq but they don't want to follow it or those who are upon ignorance. They do acts of ibadah but they do it upon jah. They are extreme in the ibadah. That's why we say that from this ayah walad dali, something which we can benefit from is that our ibadah, our ibadah, we should always look at the quality of our ibadah, not the quantity of our ibadah. Because when the Christians went into the quantity of the ibadah, 
great levels of stopping and secluding and not marrying and not doing all this nonsense yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that they were, they were misguided so our ibadah should be based upon the quality because otherwise so we have two extremes we have those who have knowledge but don't follow it and have become misguided because of knowing the truth and not following it and we have those who are extreme in actions that they do actions and they don't have no knowledge and they have also been misguided we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the truth and by this alhamdulillah we end the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. Fajazakumullahu khair.